Washington. Madam President, I ask that the quorum call be dispensed with. Without objection. Madam President, am I correct? There's a vote at 12:30. That is correct. And time is equally divided on the Einstein amendment. Correct. Well, Madam President, I rise today to support the Feinstein Amendment and to ask my colleagues, who I know have been working diligently on this legislation for several years now, to respect the very tough balance that has been sought in this legislation as this legislation came out of the Judiciary Committee. I know we passed a manager's amendment yesterday, uh, and I know that manager's amendment now is catching a lot of people off guard because there were far more changes than people realized in that manager's amendment that I think upsets that apple cart of balance that was struck in the Judiciary Committee. And so I'm uh, urging my colleagues to support the Feinstein Amendment and uh, expressing my concern for the underlying bill uh, that it is something that at this point in time I can't support. Now I don't come to that decision lightly, nor uh, the fact that I have many uh, high-tech companies in the state of Washington who might say we need patent reform and that this is good innovation. Uh, but large high-tech companies are not the only people that know something about innovation. In fact, most of the people uh, who have helped build those organizations were once the small inventors themselves of key technology. And what's at stake here is unbalancing the apple cart as it exists today to innovation, not just innovation in general, but innovation in an information age. The meal ticket for all of us is going to be the invention and creation of new products and services. So that's the great time and age that we live in. But if in this legislation we all of a sudden upset that apple cart where we are tilting the playing field in support of large corporations who were already uh, made their mark and made their markets and made their success and have slowed down on the rate and progress of innovation within their companies and do a lot to acquire technology from smaller inventors, but now all of a sudden in this underlying bill, particularly in the area of damages, make sure that the big corporations can win in any kind of legal dispute against the technology holder or creator because they are able to outlast them in a legal battle because they're more well-financed, more well-heeled, uh, the ability to draw out this battle, and because of that change in the underlying bill, leave the small guy without many resources. The only thing that the small inventor has is their intellectual property and a fair day in court. And if now we take that away from them, I guarantee you they will have less success. And when you have less success of having a thousand flowers bloom, then we have a problem. This is not about what five or six or seven large corporations can create. This is about what thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of innovators are going to create in the future, and whether they are going to be incented or disincented to do that. The Feinstein Amendment tries to protect the current process, to protect what is the rights of those inventors today under current law. And I'm sure my colleagues will say, well, you know, that's not the way the rest of the world does it. Well, I would say to my colleagues, uh, I'm not sure that the way the rest of the world does it is the mark that we're trying to hit. What we're trying to preserve is the entrepreneur spirit that has uh, been created in the United States. And I'm not saying that that isn't based on just raw creativity of individuals. It is, but it's also based on financial incentive and incentive that those individuals have that their intellectual property can be protected. But if this is going to be a game about the big boys coming to Washington and squashing the small inventors, count me out. This has to be a level playing field. And I get it's tempting to want to, in the last minute, stick into the manager's amendment, language that you couldn't get out of committee. But if we want to get this legislation through this process, 
then we have to take into consideration the rights of the inventors along with the rights of those larger companies that are trying to acquire or integrate or be part of the manufacturing on a larger scale of that inventor's technology. So I would say to my colleagues that uh, the Feinstein Amendment uh, and keeping uh, the rights of the inventors where they are gives them at least a modicum of holding on to that. I think the underlying bill uh, has changed so much in the manager's amendment that um, we are going down a road that is going to make it very difficult for us to finally get a piece of legislation. We have to respect the rights of the small individuals here. And we can't have carve-outs for specific jurisdictions like Wall Street who think that they can have their cake and eat it too. This has to be about how we move forward on a smoother patent process, but how we take into consideration that we have gotten to this great place in our country because we have had a balance and an empowerment of these technologies and not all of a sudden in one fell swoop take that away on the Senate floor and basically undermine what is the creative opportunity for the U.S. economy. It is in invention. And we want thousands and thousands and thousands of inventors, not just inventors that work for big corporations, thousands of inventors who have their rights. So I support the Feinstein Amendment, and uh, I thank the President, I yield the floor. Madam President. The Senator from California. Thank you, Madam President. I want to thank the Senator from Washington for her comments. We welcome her support, and uh, I was pleased to be able to listen to these comments. Um, what is the current status of the time allocation? The proponents have three and a half minutes remaining. And the opponents have 10 minutes remaining. Uh, I would ask that our three and a half, unanimous consent that our three and a half uh, minutes be extended so that Senator Reich, who will speak next, uh, has the time that he requires, and I have the time for a brief close. Without objection. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Madam President, uh, uh, fellow senators, I'm uh, proud to come to the floor here to uh, speak on the amendment uh, to which I am a co-sponsor. Look, this, this is simply a matter of fairness. And with all due respect to my colleague from Washington about the big boys versus the small inventors and what have you, I don't view it as that uh, at all. I really view it as a fairness issue, and that is the person who, in, who created uh, the invention gets the benefits of that creation, not the person with the fastest tennis shoes. And that's what you're doing here is you're creating what's called a race notice statute, which is similar to what uh, uh, is in place in many states on real estate filings. And it, it has a legitimate place in the real estate market, but not here. With so much on the line, with creativity on the line, it should be the person that actually does the invention uh, who reaps the benefits of that invention. And that's all this does. Uh, the other thing that I think is so important here is it preserves the situation that we've had for many, many years in place. Now, I've heard people say, oh, well, this is a poison pill. If you take this out, it kills the bill. That isn't the case at all. It simply preserves the situation that we have in place today. It's the right thing to do. It's the fair thing to do. And I'd urge an affirmative vote for this. And I'll yield the floor to uh, my colleague from California, Senator Feinstein. Senator from California. Thank you very much, Madam President. And I want to thank uh, Senator Reich for his co-sponsorship of this. And of course, I agree exactly with his statement. At this time, I'd like to briefly summarize the arguments in favor of our amendment to strike the first to file provisions from this bill. This amendment is co-sponsored, as I said, uh, by Senator Reich, Majority Leader Reid, Senators Crapo, Boxer, Ensign, and I would ask unanimous consent to add Senator Begich. Without objection. Thank you, Madam President. Proponents of the first to file argue that the rest of the world follows this system and making this change will harmonize our system with theirs. And that's true. But under our first to invent system, our nation has been by far the leader in the field of innovation. 
the leader in the field of new patents, new discoveries, new inventions. And the other first-to-file countries have been playing catch-up with our technological advances. I wouldn't trade our record of innovation for any of theirs. And I doubt many members of this body disagree with me if they really think about it. Think about the history of innovation. What sets America apart is so many of our great inventions start out in small garages and labs with driven, inspired people who have great ideas, develop them, and then they take off. I mentioned companies that have started this way yesterday. Hewlett Packard, Apple, Google, and there are hundreds and perhaps thousands of others. They started from humble beginnings, and they grew spectacularly, creating jobs for million of Ameri millions of Americans and lifting up our economy and standard of living. I know an inventor who invented Sky Vodka, and the vodka he drank disturbed his stomach. So he figured out biologically and chemically what it was, and he invented a vodka called Sky Vodka. Small inventor. That company was subsequently sold, I think, for a great deal of money. But it started with one man who had a stomach ache from drinking vodka. And now this may be just one type of example, but Apple is certainly another type of example. A garage many years ago in California, and out of that emerged this giant uh, company. So uh, these companies start from humble beginnings. They grow, they create jobs for millions of Americans, they lift up our economy and our standard of living. The National Small Business Association is a supporter of this amendment. And other small business inventor groups have joined them in saying just last week that first to file, and I quote, disrupts the unique American startup ecosystem that has led to America's standing as the global innovation leader, end quote. First to invent has served our, company, our country well. Here are the main problems, as I see it, with the bill's first-to-file system. First, the grace period. It guts the current grace period. In the words of a letter from 108 startups and small businesses that protect inventors' rights to their invention for one year, for offering them for sale or making a public use of it, among other things, before they have to file a patent application with the patent office. So there's this year's grace period for them to get their act together. Now, under the present system, instead of preparing a costly patent filing, they can concentrate on developing their invention and obtaining necessary fun funding. Uh, the majority leader just circulated a, le uh, a statement to members which really speaks to this grace period. I'd like to quote one part of that statement. The grace period comports with the reality of small entity financing through friends, family, possible patent licensees, and venture capitalists. The grace period allows small inventors to have conversations about their invention, important, and to line up funding before going to the considerable expense of filing a patent application or having to race to the patent office because they're afraid somebody else might have heard the conversation, might have stolen it from them, and moved on. In fact, S Senator Reid goes on, in many ways, the one-year grace period helps improve patent quality. Inventors find out which ideas can attract capital and focus their efforts on those ideas, dropping along the way other ideas and inventions that don't attract similar interest and may not, therefore, be commercially viable. So this uh, first to file essentially replaces this critical innovation protecting provision with a more limited and murky grace period that only runs from the undefined term of disclosure. There is no discovery. 
Litigation is sure to ensue as courts interpret this term, creating uncertainty that I believe will chill investment in startups, which in turn will dampen innovation and job growth. Unfortunately, first to file incentivizes inventors to race to the patent office to protect as many of their ideas as soon as possible so that they are not beaten to the punch by a rival. Thus, first to file will likely result in significant overfiling of dead-end inventions unnecessarily burdening both the patent office and especially small inventors. Third reason, difficulty of proving copying. The third major problem with this bill system is the difficulty of proving that someone copied your innovation, your invention, excuse me. Currently, you, as a first inventor, can prove that you were first by presenting evidence that's in your control. This is under first to invent. Your own records contemporaneously documenting the development of your invention. But under this bill, to prove that someone else's patent application came from you, was derived from you, you would have to submit documents showing this copying. And because there's no discovery, you wouldn't have those documents in your possession. So it makes proving your invention much more difficult. The bill doesn't provide for any discovery in these derivation proceedings. Therefore, the first inventor can't prove his or her claim because he or she does not have access to the documents of the alleged copier. How much time has remained to the Senator from Vermont? I will just take two minutes more. Mr. The Chairman? Senator from California, I have by, no by consent, is, is using the opponent's time. Is using my time? No, I'm not. Uh, I've asked to extend uh, our time. Madam President, we're supposed to vote at 12.30, and I, I realize the Senator couldn't be here when her amendment was brought up and couldn't be here when her amendment was, was modified. Uh, we did that for her, but I would in opposition to it, I should at least have some of my time to be able to use. I'd be very happy to, I was here yesterday, I did speak on the floor, Mr. Chairman. I did, uh, in, in a rather lengthy speech, indicate the arguments that I felt. I have asked just for a short period of time, my remarks are no more than five pages, which should take me a minute and a half more to conclude. And I hope I would Madam, be offered Madam that President, time. then at the hour of 12.30 when we're supposed to vote, I would ask consent, so far as my time has been used by those in other position, that Senator Grassley and I have four minutes uh, back of our time. Without objection. And the Senator had consent. Yeah, fine, then I would ask that my time on this side be extended for another minute and a half. The, the, the Senator has that consent. Oh, thank you very much. Um, so I have outlined the difficulty of proving copying under the first to file system. Disputes about who is the first to invent are resolved by the Patent Office in what's called an interference proceeding, which number about 50 a year only out of 480,000 patent applications. Now, the opposition infers that this is a huge problem. 50 a year out of 480,000 patent applications is a very small percentage. As I said in the beginning, Madam President, America leads the world under the first to invent system. I don't think we should fix what isn't broken. This works for people who have great ideas but don't have money, who begin in a garage, in a lab. It has worked well for our system. I ask that you join Senator Reich, Majority Leader Reed, Senators Crapo, Boxer, Ensign, Begich, and myself in voting yes on this amendment. I yield the floor, Madam President. Thank you very much. Madam President, as I said Sir, earlier... Senator from Vermont. And President, um, as I said earlier, Secretary Locke confronted the erroneous notion that the current outdated system 
that is better for small and dependent investors. So he said the cost of proving inventors rather. He said the cost of proving that one was first to invent is prohibitive, requires detailed and complex documentation and invention process. In cases where there's a dispute about who the actual inventor is, it typically costs at least four hundred thousand dollars in legal fees, even more if the case is appealed. By comparison, establishing a filing date through a provisional application establishing priority of invention costs just $110. Madam President, people remember nothing else. This amendment, and I appreciate the work of the distinguished senator from California, but her amendment is a killer amendment. It would kill this bill. The, our bill is set up so that it will be allow us to compete with the rest of the world. Right now in our patent system, we're behind the rest of the world. All the countries we have to compete with. Our bill as it's written allows us to compete with the rest of the world. Her amendment would hold us behind, back and give an advantage to those countries that we have to compete with. I yield the floor. The Senator from Iowa. I associate myself with the remarks that the distinguished chairman of the committee just made and ask people on my side of the aisle uh, to uh, not support the Feinstein Amendment. I uh, move at this point uh, to table the Feinstein Amendment and ask for the A's and A's. Is there a sufficient second? There appears to be. The question is on the to, to table the motion to table the Feinstein Amendment as modified. The yeas and nays have been ordered. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Akaka, Mr. Alexander, Ms. Ayotte, Mr. Barrasso, Mr. Baucus, Mr. Beckage, Mr. Bennett, Mr. Bingaman, Mr. Blumenthal, Mr. Blunt, Mr. Bozeman, Mrs. Boxer. Mr. Brown of Massachusetts, Mr. Brown of Ohio, Mr. Burr, Ms. Cantwell, Mr. Cardin, Mr. Carper, Mr. Casey, Mr. Chambliss, Mr. Coates, Mr. Coburn, Mr. Cochran, Ms. Collins, Mr. Conrad, Mr. Coons. Mr. Coons. Mr. Corker. Nine for me. <laughs> Mr. Cornyn. Mr. Crapo, Mr. Dement, Mr. Durbin, Mr. Ensign, Mr. Enzi, Mrs. Feinstein, Mr. Franken, Mrs. Gillibrand, Mr. Graham, Mr. Grassley, Mrs. Hagen, Mr. Harkin, Mr. Hatch, Mr. Hoban, Mrs. Hutchison, Mr. Inhofe, Mr. Noe, Mr. Isaacson, Mr. Johans, Mr. Johnson of Wisconsin, Mr. Johnson of South Dakota, Mr. Carey, Mr. Kirk, Ms. Klobuchar, Mr. Cole, Mr. Kyle. Ms. Landrew. Mr. Lautenberg. Mr. Leahy. 
Mr. Lee. Mr. Levin. Mr. Lieberman. Mr. Luger. Mr. Manchin. Mr. McCain. Mrs. McCaskill. Mr. McConnell. Mr. Menendez. Mr. Merkley. Ms. Mikulski. Ms. Moran. Ms. Murkowski, Mrs. Murray, Mr. Nelson of Nebraska, Mr. Nelson of Florida, Mr. Paul, Mr. Portman, Mr. Pryor, Mr. Reed of Rhode Island, Mr. Reed of Nevada, Mr. Risch, Mr. Roberts, Mr. Rockefeller, Mr. Rubio, Mr. Sanders, Mr. Schumer, Mr. Sessions, Mrs. Shaheen, Mr. Shelby, Ms. Snow, Ms. Stabenow, Mr. Tester, Mr. Thune, Mr. Toomey, Mr. Udall of Colorado, Mr. Udall of New Mexico, Mr. Vitter, Mr. Warner, Mr. Webb, Mr. Whitehouse, Mr. Wicker, Mr. Wyden, Spring. Senators voting in the affirmative. Blunt, Brown of Massachusetts, Cardin, Carper, Corker, Grassley, Hagan, Leahy, Lieberman, McCain, and Nelson of Nebraska. Senators voting in the negative. Ensign and Tester. Mrs. Feinstein, no. Ms. Cantwell, no. Mr. Johnson of Wisconsin, aye. Mr. Alexander, aye. Mr. Graham. Mr. Graham, aye. Mr. Thune. Mr. Thune, aye. Mr. Durbin, aye. Mr. Isaacson, aye. Mr. Moran. Mr. Moran, aye.
Mr. Burr, aye. Mr. Kyle, aye. Ms. Landrew, Ms. Landrew, aye. Mr. Portman, aye. Ms. Ayotte, aye. Ms. Klobuchar, aye. Mr. Sanders, aye. Mr. Enhoff, Mr. Enhoff, aye. Mr. Bozeman, aye. Mr. Vitter, Mr. Vitter, aye. Mrs. Hutchison, Mrs. Hutchison, aye. Mr. Coons, aye. Mr. Nelson of Florida, no. Mrs. Boxer? Mrs. Boxer, no, Mr. Brown. Mr. Brown of Ohio, aye. Mrs. Murray? Mrs. Murray, aye. Mr. Coates? Mr. Coates, aye. Rubio. Mr. Rubio, aye. Mr. Blumenthal, no. Mr. Whitehouse, no. Mr. Paul, aye. Mr. Whitehouse, aye. Mr. Blumenthal, aye. Mr. Conrad, aye. Mr. Dement, aye. Mr. Johnson of South Dakota, aye. Mr. Menendez, Mr. Menendez, aye. Mr. Lee, aye. Mr. Johans, aye. Mr. Shelby, Mr. Shelby, aye.
Mr. Webb, aye. Ms. Stabenow, aye. Mr. Bingaman, Mr. Bingaman, aye. Mr. Kirk, aye. Mr. Cochran, Mr. Cochran, aye. Mr. Toomey, aye. Mr. Franken, aye. Mr. Cole, Mr. Cole, aye. Mr. Baucus, Mr. Baucus, aye. Mr. Wyden, no. Mr. Bennett, aye. Mr. Warner, aye. Mr. Shaheen, aye. Mr. Manchin, aye. Mr. Beckage, no. Mr. Lautenberg, aye. Mr. No Way, no. Ms. Collins, aye. Mr. Reed of Rhode Island, aye. Mr. Carey, aye. Mr. Luger, aye. Mr. Wicker, aye. Mr. Rich, no. Mr. Hoven, aye. Mr. Schumer, aye. Mr. Pryor, aye. Mr. Sessions, aye. Mr. Roberts, aye. Mr. Reed of Nevada, no. Ms. Gillibrand, aye. Mr. Enzi, aye. Mr. Crapo, Mr. Crapo, no.
the snow eye. Mr. Casey. Mr. Casey, aye. Mr. Barrasso, aye. Mr. Chambliss, aye. Mr. Udall, Colorado. Aye. Mrs. McCaskill, aye. Mr. Levin, Mr. Levin, aye. Mr. Coburn, aye. Mr. Udall of New Mexico, aye. Mr. Cornyn, aye. Yeah. Mr. Hatch, aye. Ms. Murkowski, aye. Mr. Rockefeller, no. Mr. Merkley, aye. Mr. Harkin, Mr. Harkin, aye. Mr. McConnell, aye. Mr. Akaka, aye.
Are there any senators wishing to vote or to change their vote? The motion to table the Feinstein Amendment number 133 as modified has been agreed to. The, the ayes are 87, the nays are 13. Move to reconsider. So moved. Without objection. Table, yep. The, the senator from Michigan. Thank you, Madam President. I would ask uh, unanimous consent. May we have order? Thank you, Madam President. First, I, I do have an amendment to offer. I understand that it has been agreed to, so I would ask unanimous consent that the pending amendments be set aside, and I would call up amendment number 126. Is there, Is there objection? Without objection. The clerk will, will report. The Senator from Michigan, Ms. Davenow, proposes amendment number 126. On page 104, strike line 23. With Without objection. Thank you. Uh, I ask it be adopted. If there's no further debate on the amendment, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say no. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it. I the amendment is agreed to. I move to reconsider. Laid on the table. Madam With, President, without I objection. Yield. And I yield to the senator from Michigan. The senator from Michigan. Thank you very much, Madam President. And I want to thank uh, the distinguished chairman and judiciary committee and uh, our ranking member and those who are working very hard on a very, very important jobs bill here today. And on behalf of the people of Detroit and people of Michigan and Senator Levin and myself, I want to thank very much uh, the members for supporting this amendment. Uh, just a few months ago, we learned that Detroit, Michigan will be the home to the first ever satellite office of the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. This office is really great news for us because in Michigan we have a proud tradition of innovation and invention and uh, we are looking forward to continuing that tradition while reducing the backlog of patent applications so that new products can get into the market faster. Uh, this amendment we just adopted uh, would, name the new, would name the new facility after a great Michigan inventor, Elijah Michigan Ingenuity and Entrepreneurship. Uh, his parents escaped slavery and fred, fled across the border to Canada while training as an apprentice in Scotland. He came to Ypsilanti, Michigan and set up home and had a home base of, in uh, inventing things, an invention shop. And over the course of his brilliant life, Elijah McCoy secured more than 50 patents, but he's best known for his inventions that revolutionize how our heavy-duty machinery, including locomotives, function today. And uh, he has, I will not go through all of my statement at this time, uh, Madam President, I will put it in the record, but I would note uh, in interest that with his many inventions, he was incredibly effective. In fact, uh, many tried to copy his ideas, but no one could match McCoy's ideas. And in fact, machinists started asking if their engines were using the real McCoy. And so that's where we came to the, uh, the phrase, the real McCoy. We're very proud of that because of McCoy technologies. Uh, he didn't have an easy journey. Uh, as an African-American uh, in those times with the Industrial Revolution going on, but uh, he never gave up, continued inventing, and the city of Detroit today proudly celebrates Elijah McCoy Day and has dedicated his home as a historic site, and uh, we're very proud of that as well. So it's a, a great honor for us to have this first ever patent trademark satellite office and to have it named after a great leader and a great inspiration in Detroit. And I thank very much my colleagues for supporting this amendment. Mr. President, I would suggest the absence of a quorum. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Akaka.
the quorum call without objection uh, thank you mr. president I, uh, we've all watched the news uh, Madison Wisconsin Columbus Ohio Trenton New Jersey uh, other places around the country where workers uh, public employees who when you really analyze it are paid with including benefits not much more or less depending on the place than comparable private sector workers whether they're high school graduates or college graduates or whatever, the, the, the pay is pretty similar and the benefits, overall pay and benefits are pretty similar. We've seen around the, st around the country that these public employees are, in most cases, willing to share in the sacrifice of balancing budgets and share in the sacrifice of, of fighting back against this bad economy. In fact, we know that, that workers, teachers, police officers, nurses, uh, people working at the Unemployment Bureau, people working at the Department of Interior, whatever, that, that they have taken pretty big hits already in terms of lost jobs, in terms of, of no raises, in terms of, um, of paying more for their health benefits. So we know, even though these are not the people that caused the recession, any more than the workers at Lordstown, Ohio, or assembling cars or Defiance, Ohio, building engines or Northwood, Ohio, making bumpers for the Chevy Cruze, even though we know they aren't, weren't responsible for the failure of the auto industry. Uh, there just seem to be, as we've seen from these, these ideological conservative governors, there seem to be an assault all over the country on workers, blaming workers, whether they're public or private workers, blaming workers for the problems in this economy. It's, they continue to give, want to give tax cuts to the richest people to Wall Street as they take their bonuses and make big dollars and see their incomes go like this, but as workers have pretty much had no real increase in the last 10 years, wages in this country have mostly been stagnant, how can you blame the workers in this? And that's, that's why what we've seen around the country is, has been so interesting. 8,500 people two days ago in Columbus, Ohio, demonstrating not against budget cuts, because they know those are coming, but demonstrating against this direct assault by the government, by the governor and the legislature, legislative leaders, on the right to organize and bargain collectively, a right that has been part of Americana, that have been part of our values for 75 years. Why do they think we have a middle class? We have a middle class because workers could band together and say to a company that's very profitable, some of that profit you're making, we should get some of it because we're your workers and we've made your company more prosperous. Management's important, crucial. Workers are important, are crucial. And worker wages go up, management wages typically go up, but we've seen workers' wages just stagnant now, in part because of a lack of unionization or a decline in unionization. Now, we're also seeing in Madison, in Columbus, in Trenton, in Harrisburg, in Indianapolis, in Lansing, in these, these capital cities, especially in my part of the country, um, uh, Mr. President, we've seen a real play on fear. They're trying to turn private sector workers against public sector workers. They blame the UAW, the, the, the auto workers, for the problems with the auto industry. Now they're blaming the public workers for the problems with the state budgets and trying to get the auto workers, the private sector workers, and the union workers up against each other and fighting each other. And that kind of, that, that, is, that is the most base Karl Rove type politics to turn working class people one against another. It's, it's wrong, it's morally wrong, it's politically wrong, and it's, it's very wrong for our country. Now, What's also been interesting about these protests, they're not all steel workers and electricians and uh, American Federation of Government Employees and AFSCME and SEIU. There are a lot of people of faith that have been involved in this. I did a round table in an Episcopal church right off State House Square and the leaders of the church and some of the volunteers from the church were there and they know that part of my belief and, and I, don't, I don't preach or wear on my sleeve my Christianity, but they understand the Bible talks a lot about poverty and a lot about fairness and equality and, and egalitarianism, if you will. And for them to go against workers on behalf of the richest people in our country, and that's really what they're doing in the governor's office in Columbus and Madison and in Trenton and other places, 
runs counter at least to my faith. I'm not going to judge their faith. They, can, they worship what God they worship, and they read what scripture they read. But when you look at what, what my faith means, and whether, I'm, I'm, as I said, I'm a Lutheran, I'm not a Catholic, but you look at Leo the Thirteenth and, and, and what he said about what Catholicism means for workers in fairness, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, point match, whatever, point set match. I mean, that clearly spoke very definitively about this. And Mr. President, I, I've said this on the floor today, before today, but I, I wear this pen on my lapel. It's a depiction of a canary in a birdcage. A hundred years ago, the miners took a canary down in the mines. If the canary died from lack of oxygen or from toxic gas, the miner got out of the mine. He, he only had himself to depend on. He didn't have a government that cared much in those days to write safety laws, particularly child labor laws in the mines. He didn't have a union that was strong enough in those days to fight back. Too many people that are ultra conservatives, and there are many in both these bodies in the Senate and the House, want to go back to those days. They want to eliminate worker safety laws. They want to eliminate minimum wage. They're clearly going after collective bargaining. They're clearly going after so many of the things that we hold dear. And again, Mr. President, it wasn't the UAW workers, it wasn't the service employee union worker at the state capitol that, that caused this financial crisis. They've been the victims of it, just like a whole bunch of non-union workers have. But this financial crisis was caused by greed, by people overreaching, by the richest in our society, grabbing and grabbing and grabbing for more wealth, and then they're going to turn this Let's change the subject, turn this against, against those workers. That's just happened um, far too many times in our country. Now, Mr. President, yesterday, uh, I'm a new member of the Senate Appropriations Committee, and I'm lucky enough to serve on Senator Leahy's um, subcommittee on foreign operations. And we brought the Secretary of State in, uh, Secretary Clinton, to talk to us about the State Department budget. And one of the things she said, and I mentioned Madison and Columbus after she said it, but one of the things she said was that you know, it's been unions in Egypt, it's been workers in Egypt and Tunisia and around the world. Um, it's been workers who so often, sometimes through their unions, if they're allowed to have unions, sometimes through a, a more informal, non, non um, just sort of an informal collection of people in what might look like a union, but not formalized, who have taken on... Um, who have fought for freedom, who have fought for equality. A lot of this prob these problems in Tunisia and Egypt were because people are hungry, not just they want freedom, they also want fairness and a chance to make a living. But one of the things Secretary Clinton talked about is, yes, this administration actually is enforcing law, labor law in Guatemala. This administration will enforce labor laws in our trade agreements, the labor component of our trade agreements around the world. Because we, as a country, we stand for a more egalitarian workforce. We stand for worker rights. We believe workers should organize and bargain collectively if they choose. We believe in a minimum wage. We believe in workers' compensation. We believe in worker safety. We believe in human rights. And all of that is about the labor movement. And you know, you can support labor rights in Guatemala, but you better damn be sure you're supporting labor rights in Wilmington and Columbus and Cleveland and, and Detroit and Dover, Delaware and everywhere else. And that's, um, that's those were, those were, some of the words that Secretary Clinton said, I'm obviously expanding on them, but as a nation, you know, I, I, I look back in history, in some of the worst governments we've ever had, you know the, one of the first things they did? They went after the trade unions. Hitler didn't want unions, Stalin didn't want unions, Mubarak didn't want independent unions. These, these autocrats in history don't want independent unions. So when I see, when I see in Egypt, or if I see in, in the old Soviet Russia, or what I see in history tells me about Germany, I, I'm, not, I'm not comparing what's happening to the workers in Madison or in Columbus to Hitler and Stalin, but I am saying the history teaches us that unions are a very positive force in society that creates a middle class and that protects our freedom. So don't tell me you're against, don't tell me you support unions internationally, but you don't support unions here. Don't tell me you support collective bargaining in Poland, but just you oppose collective bargaining in Zanesville or Dayton, Ohio, because frankly, that's inconsistent, and ultimately, it's, it's, it's not taking the side of people whom we are supposed to represent. Uh, we know, Mr. President, we know that um, I'm, I'm proud in my state about 
Three blocks, two blocks from the Capitol, in 1876, the Capitol in Columbus, the American Federation of Labor was formed. It was the first, the, the, the actual, what we know now as the AFL-CIO, began in Columbus, Ohio in 1876, when some workers got together thinking there is some strength and some safety in numbers, and we're going to have a better standard of living in a better country and more freedom for all if we begin to coalesce in a group of people. Not to, not to cause a bust a hole in the state budget, not to hurt companies, but to make sure that, that workers are represented and get a fair shake in this society. Uh, Mr. President, it's all pretty simple. We have a strong middle class in this country because we have the right to organize and bargain collectively. We have a strong middle class in this country because we're a democracy, because workers can share in some of the wealth they create for their employers. And so I hope 10 years from now, Mr. Mr. President, and I know that in Delaware this is something you fought for with manufacturing and middle class and all, that we will see as productivity goes up and profits go up, that workers' wages will go up too. It's the American way. It's what we stand for. Nothing in our society, frankly, is more important than a prosperous middle class and what it brings to us in terms of freedom and equality. Mr. President, I, I yield the floor. Note the